Hi, in this Let's Create series, we're implementing the core game mechanic for a range of simple games. In this episode, we're going to be doing a sliding puzzle game like this. Here, you click next to the empty square and it shuffles them around and you have to try and solve the picture. Let's get started. We're going to start with a default Unity 2D project called Sliding Puzzle. The first thing I like to do is create some directories to keep everything tidy, even in a small project like this. In this example, we'll need scripts, textures, materials, and prefabs. Next, we'll create an empty game object for our game. Call this game board and center it. We're going to use this to house our game, so we want it to fill most of the screen. Our orthographic camera is five units by default, so if we increase the scale of our game board to four, that should be good. You can use this handy lock icon here to update all the dimensions at once. Now we'll add a quad. This is going to be what we make our game pieces out of. I'm choosing a quad so that we have access to the mesh, which will enable us to modify the UV coordinates to split up our texture. I could equally have used a sprite here, I'm not sure why I didn't. We'll call this game piece. Now we want to add our texture. In this instance, I'm using a nice picture of a train. I've made sure it's square already, so it fits nicely within the game. Remember to check that your image is loaded as a sprite, 2D and UI. To use this on the quad, we need to create a material. We do this by dropping the texture into the albedo channel. After putting this onto the quad, you'll see that it looks a little dark. This is because it's being affected by the lighting. We don't want any lighting to affect it in this simple 2D game, so we'll change the shader type to unlit texture. Excellent. That's all working. So we'll drag the game piece into our prefabs folder to create a prefab and delete it from the scene. For any game, there are always multiple ways to create the logic. I've chosen a method that requires just a single script. To this end, we'll create an empty game object called Game Manager to house our script and we'll add the Game Manager script to it. We'll just move the script to the scripts folder and we're good to start coding. To start, we're going to focus on creating a grid of quads with our image on. So we'll need two references, the game transform, which will be our game board to house and scale the puzzle, and the game piece prefab, which we'll have as a reference to the transform as we're going to want to position it. In the start method, we'll set the size of the game and let's just use a three by three grid for simplicity. And we'll call a new method, create game pieces, it's good practice to put the code in separate methods, even on simple projects like this, to keep the relevant code together. To this method, we're going to pass a parameter of the thickness between the tiles, because in real life puzzles, there usually is a little border there. I did it this way because I thought with really large sizes, you may want a thinner gap, but it could equally work well as a global variable. In our create game pieces function, the first thing we want to do is work out the width of each puzzle piece. Let's consider our game is on the unit grid going from zero to one then the width is gonna be one divided by the size of the puzzle. So in our case, each piece will be a third of a unit. We want to create a grid of pieces, so we iterate over the size by size 2D array. The first thing we need to do is instantiate a game piece here. We want the game to be centered, so we actually want X to go from minus one to plus one. So we'll start with minus one and double up the width multiplied by the column. This will give us the leftmost point of the puzzle piece. The anchor is in the center, so we need to add on half the width. As we double the size of our pieces, that's just our variable width. We do the same thing for the Y coordinate using the row variable, finally setting the Z coordinate to zero. Now we've got it in the right position, we need to scale it. So we set local scale to double our width. Here we subtract away our gap thickness, so there's a little bit of space between each of the quads. And the final thing to do for now is to assign a name to each quad. We're going to use the index of them in the puzzle, you might wonder why we're doing this, but we'll use this later as an easy way of detecting when we've completed the game. This would create all nine of the puzzle pieces, but for a game we want the last one to be an empty space. 
So we'll record the location in our empty location variable and just hide the game object. One thing you could do here is to not create the puzzle piece at all, but often when you complete the puzzle, it fills in that last square. So having it available to turn on is a good idea. Let's take a look at what this looks like now. We'll add on references to our piece prefab and the game board to our script. And let's hit play. Excellent. We've got each of the pieces in the right place. However, as you can see, they're all the same image. We need to make each one the right subsection of the image. So let's dive back into the code and sort this out. The reason we chose a quad with the material to display our image is so that we can change the UV coordinates of each quad to match the right part of the image. So let's do this for every element that we're showing. In order to change the UV coordinates, we need to get the mesh component. This is attached to the mesh filter of the quad. We need the UV coordinates for each vertex of the shape. So in this case, we'll need four. The UV coordinates go from zero to one, which is not the same as our quad, which is sized from minus one to plus one. So unlike when we set the local position, we need to use the half width, which is exactly what we stored in our width variable because we doubled it earlier. It's a bit confusing, sorry. The order of the vertices in the quad means that the UV coordinates are done as top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. So we simply multiply the width by the column and the height, which is also the same as the width, by the row. Making sure we add or subtract half the gap thickness to account for our slight shrinking of the quad. Finally, you attach the newly constructed UV coordinates to the mesh. Now back in Unity, we can see that each of the quads is displaying the correct portion of the texture. When doing something like this, you're bound to mess up the UV coordinates the first time, but the good thing is, it's usually obvious when you do it wrong. The next part we want to implement is the ability to click on a puzzle piece and swap it if it was next to an empty space. So the first thing we'll have to do in the code is create a list of the transforms of the pieces and add each piece to the list as we create them. This will help us identify which piece we've clicked on. We need to remember to initialize our list in the start method like this. Set the mouse clicks will process this in the update method. Input dot get mouse button down detects a mouse press with the zero indicating it's the left mouse button. When this happens, we want to do a 2D ray cast from the position of the mouse, which we obtain by camera.main.screen to world point and passing in the mouse position. Then the second parameter indicates the way we want to cast the ray in the XY direction. As we want to go straight into the screen, this is just zero. If this hits, then the ray cast hit 2D result will contain the transform of the object we've encountered. So we can just iterate over our newly created array to see which one we hit. The number of pieces in our array will always be small, so we don't need to worry about optimizing them. Once we've got our piece, we want to swap it if it's valid with the empty space. This function takes three parameters. The first two are the indices of the elements in our list you want to swap, and the third is used to modify this, as we'll see later. There are four possible directions. The tile up from us is size elements prior in the array, and the tile down from us is size elements further on. Left is the one before, and right is the one after. So let's look at this swap if valid method. Let's start with why we need the third parameter, which I've called call check. This is because not every move is valid for every tile. Consider the leftmost column. Swapping the tile on the left doesn't work because there isn't one. However, our tiles are represented as a simple one dimensional list. So the previous element is the far right piece on the column above. As such, if we're in the left column, we don't want to check to the left. Similarly, if we're in the right column, we don't want to check to the right. This is simple enough to do if we take the modulus of our index with the size. If it's zero, we're in the leftmost column, and if it's size minus one, then we're in the right. So we check for this. We don't worry about going up on the top row or down on the bottom row, as that can never equal the value in the empty location. So we pass the size as call check as imod size can never equal size. Once we've passed that check, we test if the resulting index is empty location. If it is, this is a valid move and we swap the two pieces in our pieces list. And we also swap the two local positions so they actually move in the game. We set the empty location to the new location so we're ready for the next iteration. We return true if we were successful and false otherwise. This means that when swap if valid is successful, then in the update method, it'll hit those break statements and drop out of the for loop. Without this, you may swap the position back again in one of the later checks. Let's look at this in action. It's hard to tell on the video, but I'm trying to click and nothing's happening. 
This is because our pieces prefab were made with quads, and Unity helpfully thinks you're doing something in 3D, so it has the mesh collider on it. The 2D physics calls in Unity do not interact with the 3D physics calls, so we need to swap this out for a box collider 2D. Now it works great, we can move the pieces around and play the game. So we need to add two final bits to the game to make it playable. Firstly, we need to shuffle the pieces before we start, and secondly, we need to have a check for the win condition. So let's tackle those. In the update function, we'll check that we're not currently shuffling, because we don't want to interrupt that process, so we'll use the shuffling variable to do this. If we're not, we'll check if we've completed the game. If we have, then we'll set our state to shuffling, wait a little bit before shuffling everything, because we don't want to do it instantly. And as we have that wait element to the code, this is where you're going to want to employ a coroutine. Let's start with the check completion code. This is very straightforward. If you remember, we named each of the pieces with their correct position as we created them, so we can iterate through the list checking if they're correct. The minute we find one that's wrong, we can immediately say we've not finished. If we get all the way to the end, then it's done and we return true. As this is in the update function, it'll be doing this every frame, which is clearly wasteful. It would be better to check only after you've moved a piece. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do. So let's look at the wait shuffle method. This is an I enumerator, and the first thing we're going to do is wait for our required time. You do this with the yield return new wait for seconds and pass in our duration. Once that's done, we can shuffle and then set the shuffling to false to indicate we've finished. For simplicity, I've implemented a brute force shuffling approach. We're going to pick a random element of the puzzle, which we do with the random.range to get a piece index, and then we'll simulate clicking on it. So we attempt to swap with each of its neighbors using our swap if valid function. If it worked, we increment the number of swaps we've done. We do this for size cubed iterations, which seems a good number to get a random start position. One well, last thing we add in is that we cache the last location of the empty square, as we don't want to be simulating a move only to undo it in the next iteration. This works, but it isn't ideal. Rather than picking randomly in the puzzle grid, we could just pick from one of the four possible directions to ensure one of the swap if valid functions succeeds each go. But this is just a rapid prototype, and it's simple, so even with bigger puzzle grids, this is perfectly fine. The important thing to note is that you can't just randomly place tiles in the grid. Not every arrangement of pieces has a solution. So back in Unity, we can see this in action. When we start the game, the puzzle is solved, so the shuffle logic is called after the half second delay. And now we've got a puzzle to solve. As you can see, I'm not great at this game, but when we get the last piece in place, the win condition is met, and after half a second, it shuffles it so you can start all over again. Excellent. You can vary the size of the puzzle in the start method if you want a more complicated game. That's the core game mechanics done. There are lots of things you could do to extend this game. If I were you, the next thing I'd add is animating the tile movement and a difficulty select menu. I hope you found this tutorial useful in some way. As ever, the full code is available on GitHub and I've put a link in the description below. See you next time.